from their sins. And knowing that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and 6.23. Their attitude pretty much is, well, I see that I'm wrong. It dissatisfies God. And whatever their concept of being lost is and the consequences of being lost when this life is over, I don't know. But usually they have some sort of approach if they believe in God and the Bible and Jesus Christ as the Savior. Well, I recognize that about me. And Jesus, will you save me? I'm sure you will. You said you would. So I'm asking you to save me. And then you go on living. But I don't know how many of them understand conversion. A complete change of one's life. When you actually comply with the steps and the plan of salvation, that's bringing about some radical changes in the inward man that's reflected in your viewpoints on yourself and on everybody else and on how you live life. So it's not a matter of saying, yes, Jesus has proven to be the Son of God and He's the only Savior of the world, and I accept Him like most of the denominational world does. And then they pretty much go on living like they've always lived. They may be a little less in their sins. They sort of have the idea, as you see on there sometimes, well, just remember, I, the Lord's still working on me. And, and most of the time that's saying, I'm still dibbling and dabbling in some kinds or maybe many sins, and uh, I'm just not as bad as I used to be. Well, you can't find that in your Bible. But so many people believe things are, pleasing to God, and they couldn't find it written in the Bible. Their soul depends on it, and it does. So today I want to mention that when one is truly baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, that baptism must be preceded by a confession of faith in Christ. And coming before that, there must be repentance. And then prior to that, of course, through the understanding of the Scriptures and the proofs in the Scriptures, we come to believe that Christ is the Son of God. So there's hearing the Word, understanding it. There's believing it and believing Christ. There is obedience to the commands in Acts 17, 30, to repent of your sins. I want to pause right here and say, there's where the change comes. It's that repentance that the old man dies. Dies right then. That is, the inward man now is turned completely around from the way he once lived. And now he's resolved, I will live for the Lord no matter what it takes, because of what he's done for me. So what we want to talk about today is new, the new creature in Christ. It shows how there is a complete transition in conversion. A new creature in Christ. Notice Paul said to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, you talk about the old man of sin, the old man who didn't care about Christ, the old man who did as he pleased, the person who wouldn't read his Bible, didn't care about people who did. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That interests me. It has for a long, long time now. Understanding how one's life following being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Notice, we don't say this much anymore. We ought to. When we say baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, or baptized to be saved, Mark 16, 16. That is saying those sins that are past. We used to say past and alien sins. What do you mean by alien? Well, when a person reaches the age of accountability, he sins. That immediately separates him from God. That alienates him from God. So when one is baptized for the remission of sins, in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38, or to be saved, Mark 16.16, 16, to have one's sins washed away by the blood of Christ, Acts 22.16, then that saying plainly, that one is on through the other steps of conversion, or that last one won't work. If you didn't die to sin at repentance, if you just said, I'm sorry, but you went right back to doing the same thing without trying to change, then your alien sins, the original sin that you 
And I don't use it like the Calvinist does with the sins you originally committed have not been washed away. So we need to understand that there's a reason there are those steps in the plan of salvation. Each one means a change in us. So many times it's so easy to say, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. We don't realize, especially, and I'll camp on repentance right now, just what that means takes place in a person before it can be said following one's baptism that you're a new creature. But notice also you're a new creature in Christ. Remember Paul writing Galatians 3.27 you're baptized into Christ. Remember how I said to Ephesians 1, 3, that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. There's one doorway into Christ. It's being baptized for the remission of sins. To get into the spiritual sphere, the church, where all spiritual blessings are located, forgiveness of sins, the expectation of heaven, and so forth, all being there. Now, when you read 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This agrees with the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, he didn't understand that. We won't go into all the reasons why. It suffices us now to say he didn't understand what he was talking about, about a new birth. So Jesus in verse 5 said, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now what's being said here? Well, think about 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You're a new creature in Christ. The way you used to live, the way you were living when you didn't care about God, that's all over and done with because you've turned when we talk about repentance being a turning. You've turned from that way of thinking and acting and living. There's a difference in you and the people in the world because your purposes and motives, your desires are not that way anymore when you were outside of Christ. So one must become a new creature. And that happens through the conversion process. When we do that, we have a new relationship with Christ. That's a marvelous thing. Because you see, as you stand here knowing what the Bible says, if you're not a Christian, but recognizing the proof that He's the Son of God, that's necessary. It's essential, but it's insufficient. You still stand before Him acknowledging Him to be the Son of God. You can acknowledge Him to be the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. But it won't do you any good as far as actual forgiveness of sins. By recognizing that, you do not become a new creature at that moment. It's necessary. It has to be understood, but it's not the end. Consider what's said in 1 John 2, 19. If you know that He is righteous, now think of the simplicity of this language. Ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of Him. How often have we said, do you know what righteousness is? Well, Psalm 119, verse 172. If we had room, it'd go right under this one up here. Thy tongue shall speak thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. So, when we do righteousness, we're doing what God told us to do. We're keeping His commandments. Notice also the reasoning of the Apostle Peter in this matter. When he said to those who had obeyed the gospel, been baptized to Christ for the remission of sins, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren. You read unfeigned. We don't use that much anymore. It means non-hypocritical love. is genuine. is real. You really love the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, and this is our point here, not of corruptible to seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever, 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. So one is born of the Word, the Word of God, and then the inspired Peter explains it. And this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto you, 1 Peter 1, 25. 
Now remember, Paul already declared by the same Spirit, Romans 1.16, that God has located His power to save us from sin in the gospel, the glad tidings of Christ. And he wasn't ashamed of it, neither should we be. So now we see that one is born by the gospel, when he's born of water and of the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who takes the instrument that's necessary to convert us and keep us faithful once we're Christian. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. Thus, through the gospel, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, when one comes to understand what we've repeated several times already in the study of the New Testament, what one must believe and do to be saved, he understands that, that, that one must be baptized in water for the remission of sins. I would simply refer you to the first full recorded gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 41. And you will see just exactly how Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, convicts men of sin and converts them to Christ. And it's all done with man's cooperation. Man can hear and understand. He has a will to where he can obey what God requires him. So Hebrews 5, 9 says plainly that he's the author, that is God is, of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So this constitutes the new birth. That's how one becomes a new creature. The transition was so pronounced in the life of Paul that he declared this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 So the new birth, producing a new creature, is then explained even in more detail in Romans 6.4. Remember, these folks already heard and believed the gospel. He's reminding them of these things to encourage them to remain faithful and to urge them and edify them. So Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So after baptism into Christ, we should walk in newness of life. Now, it's very interesting to note that most of the New Testament's written to those who should walk in newness of life. And yet, when you read those epistles written to individuals in churches, you'll see that there were always problems. There were sins in their lives. And that ought to, to some extent, frighten every one of us. Now, I mean in a good way, in a proper way. It should encourage us to spend much more time in prayer and Bible study. It should help us to be more mindful of how we can be drawn away by the affairs of this present world. But you see, they were crucified with Christ, weren't they, when you were baptized? Because you repented, and there you died to sin. See, you can't bury a live man. You bury dead people. So you die to sin at the point of repentance, and then you're buried with the Lord in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. So after baptism into Christ, we should walk in the newness of life. But how is this a new life? Well, let's ask it this way. How is a new life manifested? What will portray it? Well, there's a new name to be worn. A new name to be worn. You think about the name that you receive that's your family name. Do you want it tarnished? Do you want it when somebody hears your name, they think uh, derogatory, thing, derogatory things? You know, I, I've seen children disciplined, and rightly so, because they did something, and there's a blight on the family name. There's nothing wrong with that, to have a good name. You don't believe it? Read Proverbs, and you'll see how much God says about a good name and how much it should be cherished. So we need to understand that we have a name as children of God. 
And it's a name that was not haphazardly given. It was forecasted by the prophets. The great Messianic prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 5 said, Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. It shall be an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And then adding to that in Isaiah 62 in verse 2, And the Gentile shall see thy righteousness. And all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now when, we don't have time to do it now, but as you look through the first chapters of the book of Acts, you see the church established in Acts 2, but it was Jewish. They didn't even understand the gospel was to go to the non-Gentile, or to the Gentile. They had to understand that. And the plan was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. And you'll see that before the Gentiles had the gospel freely preached to them, the apostle to the Gentiles was converted. And you'll see it all falls systematically right in the book of Acts, just as the Lord had predicted. So once you've got Judea after Jerusalem, and then Samaria. Then you have Saul of Tarsus' conversion, and Apostle Paul is born, if you please. Now things are set up to where the uncircumcised Gentile will be saved. We come right into 10 to 11, it's Acts 9, where Paul's converted. And we have the household of Cornelius being converted. It's following that that we see the gospel spread on out, and Paul then, after years passed, from the church to Antioch, he goes out preaching the gospel in the Gentile world. Well, they appeared before kings as they had done in Judea. They appeared before all sorts of folks like that, and that was part of the prophecy. After this happens, then the new name will be given, and the mouth of the Lord shall name it. Well, let's look further. In Acts eleven twenty six. 26, now mind you, the apostle of Gentiles is converted in Acts 9. You have 10... The original account of Luke, he repeats it in 11, of the conversion of Cornelius and his household. And then before chapter 11 is over, after he goes back over Peter's presentation of what happened to him after he went to Jerusalem, look here, 1126, and the disciples were called Christians first, Antioch. Now if you look at the Greek structure of that, it's not just by saying, hey, that bunch of Christians over there, Somebody happened to think of it, or his denominations used to try to say, well, it was given in derision. It didn't come from God. Well, the prophecy said, the mouth of the Lord shall name it. And if you will read the description of many of the people that were dwelling there, some had come from Jerusalem down to Antioch, it tells you about prophets. Not only that, the apostle Paul was there. So I think you will find that uh, they were called Christians because God, through the prophets, announced that's the name. And it falls right in line with everything else prophecy said had to take place before the new name would be given. The final thing was that the Gentiles would have the gospel preached to them. The new name was known by Agrippa. Remember, he said in Acts 26, 28, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And then when we come down to Peter's writing to those who were Christians, in 1 Peter 4, verse 17, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The American Standard 1901 says, In this name. So the name Christian is the family name of God's people. It means of Christ. And it denotes then that we belong to Him. We're His own. John wrote, 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. How often do you sit down when things don't go right especially? You ought to be doing it all the time. And say, now remember, you are a child of the living God. What does that imply about you? And what does it imply about God's attitude toward you? And what does that imply about God's care for you? But we also have a new and living hope, a new living hope is given. 
I want you to think about this for a minute. This goes along with the new name. We have the new name. The newborn child. He has a new hope. And it was never before realized. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 4, Peter writes to Christians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively, a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. If you ever sit down and thought, and again, that's 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. If you ever thought, the older you get, I guess it can work this way more because more time changes things. You think about when you grew up. You think about how things were then. You think about your family. You think about your kin folks. You think about your childhood friends. You think about how society was. You know, it's never going to be that way again. Never is it going to be that way again. Now, it may be in another society, another culture, or even here over a period of time, things could change and work to where it could be something like that, but never just exactly like it was. And, and of course, sometimes you say, I'd like to go back there. And people reminisce like that. There's a song that's been around for a long time called Supper Time. And that's because we reminisce the time when we had, if we had a good home, a lot of security. Homes were meant to provide security. One reason children are such a mess today, there's, they have no more security and probably less of it at home than they would outside the home. But if you come from a good home, you remember good things. But it's never going to be that way again. But there is a place called heaven. And it never will change. It's the home of the soul. It's the place where God intended you to be. So we're just passing through, as we say in the song sometimes. We're pilgrims. We're just here to learn how we ought to, want to, we ought to live so we can be in heaven. It's so easy to think we're here and we're going to be here and everything's always going to be this way. And we tend to solve problems or attempt to, so then we bring far more problems on us because we try to solve them on the basis of, well, here's the way it goes here. How can it be any different anywhere else? But it will be. There's hope for those in Christ, whereas those out of Christ are desolate and hopeless. These blessings God provided for those who have been born again, who are new creatures, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil. Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. We can speak with more confidence and assurance now and here's why. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, 2 Corinthians 3.12. I've never really appreciated as far as preaching and that kind of plainness of speech, why a person wanted to say, I want to be a preacher. And try to speak in ways that nobody gets the message. And you know why they do it? They don't want somebody to get after them. Well, they don't have love of themselves, love of God, love of the Word, or love of the people they preach to. Before being born into Christ, we were, according to Paul writing the Ephesians, without hope. I don't know whether any of us living in America understands what it is to be without hope unless we really think about sin and how it separates us from God and there's but one way for the forgiveness of sins and one way to heaven and really contemplate that. To be in a state where there is no expectation of getting out of it. You know, when the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor in the Arizona was sunk, turned upside down, and there were men inside there, and they're still inside there. There remains. How there must have come a point in their minds, there's no hope. We're going to die right here, and there's not a thing in the world anybody can do about it. Well, in this life, if you're a Christian, of course, you don't end here. And nobody really does. But I'm talking about saved. But I imagine those in torment in hell. Your mind wants to say, well, somewhere out there there's a way out. No. It's just always that way. 
Yeah, but something. No. This is where it is. You get there, you're there. And you don't count time of years anymore than you do in heaven. Have you ever noticed, and you do this in your study sometime, when you study about what the Bible says about the resurrection, notice how it tends to focus as much detail as it gives us on the resurrected body of the saved. You don't have much said about the resurrected body of the lost. Except it's called the resurrection to death. And it's described as a place, as Jeff brought out the other night, where the worm dieth not. You, you realize that you're not going to be glorified in that body like you will if you die faithful to the Lord. You're going to have a body because you're resurrected. But it's the resurrection of damnation. It's a body fitted for hell just as the bodies of the faithful are fitted for glory in heaven. Now, I don't know, maybe just like this body that decays and hurts but it just never ceases to be. Because you see, you have existence in heaven and hell. A personal existence. But it's only life in heaven because eternal life is a quality. It's not duration. It's quality. That's why you exist, but you don't live in hell. You exist in hell. And it's called the second death. It's eternal death. There is no hope. There's no way you can cry out, have mercy, and it be heard. This is the reason that today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Here's the place to become a new creature. Here's the place to determine I'll be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as I know that my labor is not in vain, pointless, worthless, in the Lord. How much have we read already that mentions in the Lord? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So we were without hope, without God in the world outside of Christ. But look what he then says. But now in Christ, you sometime were far off or made near by the blood of Christ. I suggest this is a good one to remember when you're observing the Lord's Supper and you've taken the fruit of the vine. We're made near by the blood of Christ. This blood that we're commemorating in the fruit of the vine is blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. It's the blood that you contacted when you were baptized into Christ. It's the blood that cleansed you of your sins. It's the blood that continues to cleanse you from your sins as you walk faithful before Him, as we quoted from 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So thus having been brought into Christ, we are, Titus 2, 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Then we have a new purpose in life. Now let me ask you. I don't know how long everybody here has been a Christian. Some longer than others. But is your purpose any different now than it was before you obeyed the gospel, however many years ago that was? Is there a change in your purpose in thinking and planning and viewing and living and association? Should be. The new relationship, the new name, and new hope should convince us that we must have a new aspiration and a new purpose in living. Paul wrote, if ye then be risen with Christ. Now notice, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with Him in glory. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Our behavior must have been changed so that the world can see a difference. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul said, I beseech you. Now remember, that's like falling on the floor before somebody and begging them to do or not do something. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present yourselves a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable unto God. It's your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So each new child of God must go forth as a non-conforming transformer. Now, I guess I should have put that on a PowerPoint. 
because that's what we don't use much. But I didn't. A non-conforming transformer. If you're faithful to Christ, that's exactly what you are. You don't conform to this world. Your mind's been renewed by the knowledge of the truth, and by that truth you know how to live, and you've been transformed, and you have a gospel that you teach that will transform others. We have a new evaluation. What things were gained to me, Paul wrote, those I counted lost for Christ? Yea, doubtless. I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. There's one reason we don't know our Bible. We've never imbibed that spirit. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but refuse, that I may win Christ. Philippians 3, 7, and 8. But we have a new home with the Father. As one born in the family of God, a new creature in Christ, the child of God looks for a new home. If you're still looking for your home here, you may have to ask yourself the question about, have I really been converted? Am I really transformed? Jesus promised, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 2 and 3. We sing so much and so many times as we did today about the home of the soul, about heaven. John said, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we shall, He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. 1 John 3, 2. Surely this prospect of our new eternal home makes the journey through earth worthwhile. And it even establishes and strengthens our faith. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. You see what we have the world doesn't have, or the apostate child of God. That's how you go to bed at night with peace, is to know this is what is awaiting on every faithful child of God. Concerning Abraham, the Scripture says, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11.10 God's not going to deprive the faithful of their reward. But now they desire a better country, the Hebrews writer said. That is, a heavenly. Wherefore God's not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. Hebrews 11 and verse 16. Coming down to the end, pull all this together about being a new creature in Christ. There's nothing withheld from those who come into Christ in complete obedience. Underscore complete obedience. In each step in the plan of salvation, great things happen in the inward man. God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1.3 and when one partakes of the blood of Christ in the sense of it's applied to you in obedience to the gospel, when you're baptized into Christ for the remission of sin, one becomes a new creature in Christ. You can't become a new creature any other way. There's just no other way you can. You'll remain in your sins and cut off from God. If you die that way, there's no hope. Notice what Paul said to Timothy. No doubt, warning Timothy to realize this in his own life and his preaching to others. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Let that sink in. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake. That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Let me see if I can say it this way as I close the lesson. If anybody's going to be a Christian... Of Christ. If anyone is going to serve Christ faithfully according to several abilities based on the knowledge of the truth, acting in the authority of Christ, Bible school teacher, preacher of the gospel, deacon, elder, 
It must be with this disposition. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake. If Jesus endured what he did for the church, those are the elect, to make it possible to come into existence, then as a member of the spiritual body of Christ, a Christian, a new creature in Christ, I ought to have that same disposition. I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I assure you, if you adopt that view and think about it and the implications of it in your life, It'll make you live a better life. You'll spend more time studying the Bible, reflecting on your life and the light of it, in prayer and supplication, making your requests made known to God. You'll think more about godly things. And the idea of seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness will make more sense to you. So in thinking about this, I, I want to appeal to anybody here that's not a Christian. Anybody here that, though you may have believed in Christ, the Son of God, Repented of your sins. Confessed your faith in Him. In other words, you're willing to say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God. But if you haven't been immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so your sins can be forgiven. It's because you see, you're baptized to His death. He shed His blood in His death. And the blood must contact you for your sins to be forgiven. If you haven't done that, you're lost. Are you willing to do it today and live the rest of your life like the New Testament says in the Lord's church? For if you're baptized for the remission of sins, He'll add you to His church to be a new creature in Christ. I know we'd want to help you any way we can. And we stand ready to help you now in assisting you to obey the gospel. If you need to become forgiven of sins, if you know you're lost, we beg of you to obey the gospel if a child of God, if you've sinned and you're not repenting of them, then we urge you to do that. Come confessing it and pray God for forgiveness. Leave here today cleansed of your sins, a new creature in Christ with the hope of eternal life, wearing the name Christian, and going to heaven. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.